begin reading with verse 31. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Lord, we thank you for your word. You're good to us. Help us as we look together therein. In Jesus' name, amen. God is good to the Baptist, is he not? He's good to everyone. But particularly we'd say that we thank God for being doctrinally sound as far as the scriptures are concerned. I know that we have preached a message here concerning predestination. I'm not certain that this we have covered before, but I thought it would be fitting, as Brother McGuire mentioned during the Sunday school lesson, to talk about the doctrine of election. I assured him that this was not Calvinistic, but it was against Calvinism, and I think it is good for us to understand who we are as Baptists and that we should reject the attempts of some who claim to be Baptists today to teach us that Calvinism is scriptural. Folks, it is not. It is a damnable heresy, and it is to be rejected. The Bible here in verse 33 of Romans chapter 8 says, "...who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect?" We want to examine what the scripture has to say this morning about the elect. Turn with me, if you will, to the book of Isaiah 45. Isaiah chapter 45. And we will quickly read some verses to lay the groundwork for this lesson. Isaiah 45, and the Bible says in verse 4, For Jacob my servant's sake, and Israel mine elect. I have even called thee by thy name, I have surnamed thee, though thou hast not known me. Here we have a definition of the word elect in Scripture. The Bible says, Israel, mine elect. Now this will not vary at all in the Word of God. Israel, mine elect, is told to us in the Old Testament times concerning the fact that God chose Israel. And when we look to the New Testament then, the book of Romans chapter 11. Romans 11, we are examining what the Scripture tells us concerning New Testament times. Romans 11, and beginning with verse 25, For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And so all Israel shall be saved, as it is written, There shall come out of Sion the Deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto to them when I shall take away their sins. As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes. But as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sakes. In the Old Testament, it was Israel designated as the elect. In the New Testament, you certainly know that this book was, was given to the apostle by the Spirit of God to pen to New Testament saints. And here, Israel again is identified as the election. And we are looking at time periods, if you will. Back to the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 24. In Matthew 24, and beginning with verse 21, we read, For then shall be great tribulation, 
Now, it's not difficult to discern the time of which the Scripture is speaking here. It's a time that's yet in the future. It is the tribulation period. Folks will not be here during that time. Matthew 24, verse 21, For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no nor ever shall be. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake... Those days shall be shortened. Now here is a problem that people have, and a doctrinal problem, if you will, that arises from not properly discerning what the Scripture says concerning the identity of the elect. You see, there are many, all of the Catholics, all of the Protestants, and even some Baptists today and throughout history, have believed that in the New Testament... The elect is talking about Christians. Folks, it is not talking about Christians at any time. I would submit to you that every time the word elect is used in the word of God, with the exception of one, where it speaks of elect angels, that every other time the word elect is used to describe a Jew, either Israel as a nation or Jews individually. And when we think of the time period that's given to us here in Matthew chapter 24, the time of the tribulation, when we understand that the elect are Jews, we know that it's not talking about saved people. But because Protestants, because Catholics, and because some Baptists are guilty of practicing the unscriptural doctrine of covenant theology, they have replaced Israel with the church. It's called replacement theology. And they think that the church is now the elect, that God only di died for some, but he didn't die for all. And those whom he chose to die for are known as the elect. Folks, that's an unscriptural teaching. It's not found in the Word of God anywhere. But because they are unable to discern the difference between the times, then this false doctrine gains ground. And there are many today, and among independent Baptists, who believe that we will go through part of the tribulation. It is known as the mid-tribulation, and today, in order to disguise that term, mid-tribulation doctrine, they will say we're pre-wrath, that we'll only go through part of the tribulation, but not the most severe part of the tribulation. The reason why, the reason why that they are able to teach that, and that gains any hearing at all among independent Baptists today, is because they are not able to properly discern the identity of the elect here in Matthew 24. And the scripture goes on to say, Verse 23, Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there believe it not, for there shall arise false Christ and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Behold, I have told you before, wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers, believe it not. For as the lightning cometh out of the east, and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For whensoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather to gather his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Three times the word elect is used in Matthew chapter 12. 24, not one time is it talking about any Christian that has ever lived, is living, or will live. It is always talking about the Jews, God's chosen people upon this earth. And at that time, at the end of the tribulation period, there will be a gathering. It will be a gathering of the elect. Not of Christians, but of Jews. And if you compare this scripture here in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 31 with Revelation 7, Revelation 14 verse 16, Revelation 16 verse 15, and the book of Matthew chapter 25, you'll see that it's always talking about Israel and only about Israel for only Jews. With the exception of that one passage, the elect angels, only Jews are referred to in the scripture as the elect. We must make the distinction. If not, we will 
the prime candidates to embrace error such as Calvinism and error such as a mid-tribulation rapture. And folks, we're going out of here before the tribulation starts. And we thank God for it. Back to the book of Isaiah 65. We're just laying the groundwork. And we'll quickly move on. Isaiah 65, there is another time period. You Bible students understand this. In Isaiah 65, and beginning with verse 17. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth. Has that happened yet? We know that it hasn't. It's yet in the future. It is after the tribulation period. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former should not be remembered nor come into mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem a rejoicing, and her people a joy. And I will rejoice in Jerusalem and joy in my people. And the voice of weeping shall be no more heard in her, nor the voice of crying. There shall be no more thence an infant of days, nor an old man that hath not filled his days. For the child shall die an hundred years old, and the sinner being an hundred years old shall be accursed. And they shall build houses and inhabit them, and they shall plant vineyards and eat the fruit of them. They shall not build and another inhabit, they shall not plant and another eat. For as the days of a tree are the days of my people, and mine elect shall long enjoy the work of their hands. Mine elect. Again, the scripture is talking about a future time. It's referencing the millennial kingdom when the Lord Jesus Christ will reign on this earth in the midst of his people. And he will create Jerusalem. It's talking about Jerusalem, the place that the Jews will inherit as the Lord Jesus Christ gives it unto them. At that time, Jerusalem will rejoice. No more crying, no more weeping at that time. That's not today, folks. It's a time that's yet in the future. And mine elect, the scripture says, shall long enjoy the work of their hands. Why have we taken time to read the passages that we have so far? In Isaiah 45, we have talked about Israel known as the elect in the Old Testament times. In Romans chapter 11, Israel is identified as the elect in New Testament times. In Matthew chapter 24, it's Israel the elect during the tribulation period that will be gathered unto the Lord. And in Isaiah 65, a time yet in the future in the millennial kingdom, it's Jews. It's Israel that are identified as the elect. And now we go to Isaiah 42. The scripture tells us in Isaiah 42 and beginning with verse 1. Behold my servant whom I uphold, mine elect. Now here is the first time the word elect is used in Scripture. And folks, there is something to say about the teaching of first mention in the Word of God. It does have some significance. Behold my servant whom I uphold, mine elect. Now, we've already told you that every time the word elect appears in Scripture, with that one exception, it is talking about Jews, either Israel as a whole or one particular Jew. Now, I know that as Bible students, you'll be able to discern the identity of the one spoken of here in Isaiah 42. Behold my servant, whom I uphold mine elect. This is one person in particular. In whom my soul delighteth, I have put my spirit upon him. He shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. He shall not cry nor lift up, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. A bruised reed shall he not break, and the smoking flag shall he not quench. He shall bring forth judgment unto truth. He shall not fail nor be discouraged till he have set judgment in the earth, and the isles shall wait for his law. Thus saith God the Lord, he that created the heavens and stretched them out, he that spread forth the earth and that which cometh out of it, he that giveth breath unto the people upon it, and spirit to them that walk therein. I, the Lord, have called thee in righteousness, and will hold thine hand, and will keep thee, and give thee for a covenant of the people for a light of the Gentiles to open the blind eyes to bring out the prisoners from the prison and them that sit in darkness out of the prison house. You know the identity of this person, do you not? It is the Lord Jesus Christ referred to as mine elect there in Isaiah 42. And unless we have any doubts about that, we go to the book of Matthew chapter 12 where the Lord Jesus Christ himself is teaching and references that portion of Scripture from Isaiah 42. Matthew 12 verse 14, Then the Pharisees went out and held a council against him how they might destroy him. But when Jesus knew it, he rejoiced. 
withdrew himself from thence, and great multitudes followed him, and he healed them all, and charged them that they should not make him known, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, Behold my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved, in whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him, and he shall show judgment to the Gentiles. He shall not strive nor cry, neither shall any man hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed shall he not break, and smoking flag shall he not quench, till he send forth judgment unto victory, and in his name shall the Gentiles trust. The Lord Jesus Christ identifies himself as the elect of Isaiah 42. Again, folks, we'd say that every time, beginning with the first mention of the word in Isaiah 42, verse 1, every time that the word elect, election, elect is used in Scripture, with the exception of that one when it references elect angels, and you know those are not talking about men, every time it mentions the elect, it is either talking about one Jew in particular, the Lord Jesus Christ, your Savior, or about Jews as a whole. Never at one time is it talking about any Gentile who has ever lived or will live upon the face of the earth. It would help us to see that distinction in Scripture. And we can see as we look at all of those references, and there are not that many of them, and we don't have time to cover them all this morning, but we can see if we keep the definition of the elect in mind, that that is exactly how the word is used every time it appears on the pages of God's word. And in case we doubt that the scripture in Isaiah 42 and Matthew chapter 12 is talking about the Lord Jesus Christ, there are some additional references. Isaiah 49, 6, Isaiah 61, verses 1 and 2, Matthew 4, verses 13 through 17, Luke 1, verses 76 through 79, Luke 2, verses 25 through 32, Luke 4, verses 17 through 19, John 1, verses 1 through 12, John 3, verses 16 through 21, John 12, verses 44 through 46, Acts 13, verses 46 through 49, Acts 15, verses 13 through 20, Acts 26, verses 15 through 23, Romans 15, verses 8 through 12, 2 Corinthians 4, verses 3 through 6, and 1 Peter 2, verses 6 through 10. We turn to Colossians 3, verses 12 through 13, just to name a few. Those are cross-references, folks. There is more Scripture to back up what we are teaching this morning than anyone ever has for suggesting that the elect are... Uh, Gentiles who have been chosen of God for salvation and others chosen to not be saved. In the book of Colossians, Colossians 3 and verse 12, the use of the word elect and let's, with the knowledge we have, define this. Colossians 3 verse 12, put on therefore as the elect of God. As the elect of God. There's a comparison being made here. I know you students don't want to hear an English lesson, but the word as is making a comparison. Put on, therefore, the scripture says, as the elect of God. Well, who is the elect of God? Using first mention, it's the Lord Jesus Christ. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God. Holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. The scripture defines the elect here as Christ. We are supposed to be like him. He's the only one that has bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, and forbears at all times. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. So when we know the definition, it definitely helps. And we make it now back to our text where we began in Romans chapter 8. And we went through all of that so that we could more properly understand this passage of Scripture. In Romans chapter 8, the Bible says in verse 33, Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? Now we're able to understand this verse within its context. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? Now, if we were Calvinist and we approach this passage of Scripture, we would identify the word elect here as those who have been chosen unto salvation. But there'd only be one great problem with that. The Scripture answers the question, who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect, in the affirmative. It is God that justifieth. Now, if he had chosen us to salvation, why is he laying anything to our charge? You understand what a charge is. If you have a credit card and you've ever used it, a charge is something you owe. It's something you have to pay. 
It's not a credit. There's been something that will be taken from you. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? If that's talking about us, then there's still something we've got to pay because it says it is God that justifieth. But let's use the scriptural definition of the word elect. Is it talking about Jews here? No. Is it talking about angels here? No. Is it talking about one Jew in particular? Absolutely. It's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? Well, he's called mine elect in Isaiah 42 verse 1. It is God that justifieth. Folks, you understand that there was something laid to the charge of Jesus Christ. Your sins and my sins. You understand that the scripture is absolutely right when it says, It is God that justifieth. You know what God did? He took your sins and He laid them on the Lord Jesus Christ. And He took the righteousness of Christ and He put it upon you. That's called the doctrine of imputation. And the Scripture tells us, if we look earlier in Romans 3, in Romans 3 and verse 21, But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely, By His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God to declare, I say at this time, His righteousness that He might be just and the justifier of Him which believeth in Jesus. And the Scripture here gives us the definition of justification. For justification means to declare the righteousness of one in the place of another. And folks, when we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior, His righteousness is declared in our place. I'm telling you, if that were not the case, I would never be able to stand on the day of judgment. I cannot... I cannot enter into heaven. I could not stand before the judgment seat of Christ in my own merit and in my own righteousness, which is as filthy rags. I have to be justified through the Lord Jesus Christ. And His righteousness is declared in my place and in your place. He has justified us, and He did it by taking the sins of the world upon Himself. To Isaiah Isaiah 56. Or 53, verse 6. You know the passage of Scripture. Isaiah 53 and verse 6. The Bible says, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. The Lord hath laid on him. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. The Scripture told us that God, the Lord, laid on him the iniquity of us all. Verse 10 in the same chapter, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul into death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. The Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He did indeed bear our sins, and we are grateful. The book of Hebrews chapter 9, just a few more references to prove the fact that God the Father did lay on God the Son who is identified as the elect, the sins of the world. And in Hebrews 9 and verse 24, For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but in the heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God for us, nor yet that he should offer himself often, as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with the blood of others. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world, but now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after 
after this the judgment, so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. And the scripture says in Hebrews 10 and verse 10, by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And in 1 Peter chapter 2, the scripture tells us there, 1 Peter 2, and beginning with verse 21, for even here in two were you called because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, reviled not again, when he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. And so when the Bible speaks in places like Romans chapter 8 and verse 33, who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect, we know by comparing Scripture with Scripture that the elect will only be identified in Scripture three ways. Either as the elect angels, we understand about that, we're not confused. As Israel, we understand that. And as the Lord Jesus Christ. And folks, when we see that, Romans 8 verse 33, the only, the only one of those three that works, and the only one that matches with Scripture, is that the Lord Jesus Christ is the elect upon whom the Lord hath laid the sins of us all. He had a charge laid to Him so that we would not have one laid to us. And what a blessing it is. Preacher.